everybody. Good to see you today. I want to let you know I've missed you so much. I love, 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 love you. And I'm so glad to be back today. I'm ready for God to do something incredible among us. Hey, I um, want to say a big hello to our church online family today, as well as always want to say a big shout out to all the guys and gals in every single one of our Department of Corrections around America. Come on, everybody. Would you make them all feel welcome today? God bless you guys. Right on. Well, hey, while you're pulling up your message notes that are available for you on your Life Fellowship app, let me just remind you that this next week is Easter, and when you leave today, we're going to put one of these little brochures in your hand. We're going to have eight different services available for you. Two on Good Friday, which are going to be distinctly different than the six that happen on Saturday and Sunday. And, and let me just remind you, we have all brand new service times, okay? So don't show up at the wrong time because you're used to doing what you always do. All right, so make sure that you pay attention to that. And let me just encourage you quickly with three quick things. Number one, I'm, I'm going to challenge every one of us to invite someone to be here uh, for our Easter services. You need to know that Easter is your opportunity to get your best yes from somebody. Studies show us that nine out of ten people, if just simply asked, would come to an Easter service with you. And the way that I'm challenging you to do it is something like this. That you ask them, hey, what service would you like to attend? And whatever service time that they select, that's the time that you attend. Okay? So to say, I'll meet you in the lobby. We'll, we'll go, I'll buy you a coffee from the Blends Cafe, and then we'll sit together. It's going to be an incredible time. Now, if you're not planning on bringing somebody, can I just encourage you? to attend one of our non-optimum service times, okay? Because our optimum service times, they're going to pack out. We will be in overflow, okay? So maybe it's the Saturday night services or the, the early Sunday or the late Sunday services and be a part of, of those. And then I'm asking everybody to consider parking off campus all Easter weekend. So right now, already on our normal before Easter Sundays. We already run out of parking spots on our current campus. And so I'm just asking you, would you maybe not consider parking over at Right Now Media? There's 180 parking spots available there as well as we've, we've checked in with the city of McKinney. And they said, man, you are more than welcome to park up and down Henneman Way as long as you park in the direction that traffic is flowing. Okay. You guys got that? That's how that works, okay? Because here's the reason why, okay? Here's what happens. When the parking lot is packed out, there are people that God has been literally spending 10 years to get them to walk through the doors of a church. They're gonna drive onto our campus. They're gonna circle the parking lot once. They may do twice. And then they go home. And I just, I just believe that we need to create as much space as we possibly can, and I'm asking you to help us out with that. So pre-decide now that regardless of what service you attend, you're going to park off campus, and then if you can. And then at, at the same time, maybe help us out by doing that every single week, all right? Second thing is I'm going to ask you next week to participate in the services, meaning uh, you have just as much of a role to play as I do in creating an Easter experience for all of our guests. So one of the things that you may not know about my testimony is that when I all went all in with God, it wasn't because of the preaching. It wasn't even because of the music. It was the people. Like I watched the way that they were on fire for God, the way that they worshiped God, the way that they greeted one another. They actually had smiles on their faces and they looked like they enjoyed being there. And I thought to myself, man, I want that. I want that in my life. And so I'm just asking, this next weekend when you show on up, whatever your normal level of participation is, take it to a whole nother level, baby. Come on. Like, when you show up, if there's somebody that you've never met in your entire life, why don't you just walk up and just say, hey, my name's Chris. Happy Easter. Glad you're here. 
In fact, my challenge is find 10 people after service and 10 people before service. You just give a high five to you. And again, I'm not talking about in service. <laughs> Like, like get outside of our little spheres of bubbles of influence and just go weave a web of inclusion. So like participate. So at the very end of the service, when I walk through the spiritual annual survey, don't just, just breeze by that. No, I'm asking everybody to participate. Let's show every person that walks through the doors that our God is alive and well and he has changed our lives. I just want you, I'm not asking you to act. I'm not asking you to put on a show. I'm asking you to be real. And last thing is uh, next week, we're receiving our Easter offering. And so you guys know this, that we only take two special offerings a year, one at Christmas, one at Easter. And literally this offering is going to strengthen the base of who we are as a church and then propel the gospel around the world. And I'm just asking you beforehand to pray, listen to God and do what he says. That's it. And I'm, you're probably not even going to hear much about it next week. Because isn't it true that a lot of people, the reason why they get turned off about God and church is, well, the church just wants more money. Well, you guys are mature enough to know that it takes finances to keep the lights on in this place, to, to continually have the gospel go around the world. This last week, we had over 300 young people, our young adults, packed out this auditorium. The most incredible thing. Well, that just doesn't happen. It happens because people are generous in their giving. And so just know that I'm challenging you to be a part of this. Now today, I'm very excited about this message because I'm going to be bringing a message to you all about the Saturday that was in between Good Friday and Easter morning. And honestly, there's not a lot of scriptures that talk about that Saturday, what actually happened on that day. So a lot of people assume that not much was taking place, but you would be greatly mistaken. In fact, this is Luke's account of what happened on that day, that Saturday. He said, now there was a man named Joseph, a member of the council, a good an upright man who had not consented to their decision and action. And again, it's talking about the decision to crucify Jesus. He came from a Judean town of Arimathea, and he himself was doing what? He was waiting for the kingdom of God. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and he took it down. He wrapped it in linen cloth, placed it in a tomb, cut in the rock, one in which no one had yet been laid. And I want you to notice this next phrase here. It was preparation day. And the Sabbath, which was Saturday, was about to begin. So the word Sabbath literally means this. It literally means to cease from your labor. So this was a day that no work was taking place. So literally everybody felt like they were suspended in this waiting, preparation, not much going on, so they thought, kind of day. But what I need you to understand is what was actually taking place is that they were stuck in between what I call the pain of Friday and the promise of Sunday. And anybody that has been through pain in your life, you've got this pain that you've been going through, and yet you haven't yet experienced the promise of God answering your prayer, fulfilling the thing that you need deliverance through and from. You kind of feel like you're in the middle of this gap, because any time that there's the middle between the promise and the pain, there's always a gap gap. And maybe you're here today and you can relate to this. Like you just feel like there's this, you know that God is faithful, but you've not yet seen the reality of that take place in your life. In fact, I will say it like this. There's always a gap between the pain of Friday and the promise of Sunday. You're living in the gap right now. 
So you know that God's going to come through and he's going to be faithful to you, but it hasn't happened yet. You're just stuck. You feel like you've, you're not moving anywhere. And I really believe that God is going to show up in a massive way and he's going to help us in something that I think that we all need to learn. In fact, Saturday actually teaches us something that's not very fun. And you're not going to like this. But there's always a waiting experience in your spiritual journey. There's always a season of, of waiting. And that's really hard for those of us that we live in America, like we are entrenched in the culture, because we live in this fast-paced, drive-through Amazon culture of today. Like, honestly, we don't even need to go to the stores anymore. You just grab your little Amazon app, you push your button. By the time you finish pushing your button at the doorstep, is your little package that you just, you just order like it's already there, like I'm telling you. We're just not... We're, we're not happy with this, with, with this whole process of waiting. But I need you to look in my eyes, every person. Listen to this. Today, for those of you that you are in the middle of the gap between the pain and the promise, I am going to encourage the fire out of you in this service. Because you are going through something difficult right now. You're going through something painful. And all that you see is you see a lifeless tomb. You see a dead situation. And what I need you to understand today is that there is more happening right now than you ever could dream possible. In fact, God is working behind the scenes in your life in massive ways. Massive ways. In fact, when you talk about the theological truths of this Saturday, the day in between Good Friday and Easter Sunday morning. There's not much that we find in Scripture on this day. In fact, I've just made the decision that I'm not going to dive into the theological side of it all. And the reason is, is because there's so much debate on it. I've actually read through, studied for about five hours, reading through all kinds of literature and commentaries and, and, and statements of the past and the way people believed for centuries in this process. And what I've discovered is this, that most people, they believe that when Jesus died on that Saturday, that he actually descended into hell and he confronted hell. There's other people that believe that when Jesus was on the cross, that he took on the sins of all mankind. And because he became our sin for us, that he had to descend into hell so that he could be tortured, that he could suffer in a place called hell on our behalf. But I'm just telling you, everybody, I don't believe that. I truly believe that when Jesus was on the cross and he said, it is finished, the wrath of God was satisfied at that moment in time. Our Jesus did not die a sinner. He died victorious, a victor. Amen. That's what I believe. But there are some verses in the Bible that kind of give us a clue as to what happened on that Saturday. One of those is in Ephesians. It says this, of talking of Jesus, that he actually descended to the lower earthly regions. Another verse says this in 1 Peter, for Christ also suffered once for sins. And that's the cross. The righteous for the unrighteous to bring you to God. And honestly, that's what he did. He destroyed, he broke the sin barrier so that we can all have access to God the Father. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. And after being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits. Now, there's a lot that's there. But I will tell you this, that most theological beliefs around Saturday can't definitively tell you what took place on that Saturday. Because there's not enough conclusive verses that actually tell us. But according to this verse, we know that when Jesus died, he went into a place called Sheol. It's the holding place of the dead. 
and that he preached. And most scholars and theologians believe that he actually went and spoke to the Old Testament saints that needed to experience salvation in their lives. In, in fact, bottom line, you need to know this, that in the gap, Jesus was not just laying in a tomb in a dead body. No, no, you need to know that on that Saturday, it's not just silent Saturday. It's actually a day that he descended into hell. He was doing work. He was confronting hell on your behalf, on my behalf. And a lot of times we get into the situations of life. We're in that gap. We're in the painful moments. And we just look up to God and we think, God, are you even listening to me? Are you doing anything in the midst of what I'm asking you to do? do. And you need to know that there's more happening than you could ever even imagine happening behind the scenes because your God is working on your behalf. In fact, for 1,500 years after the resurrection, the early believers would recite as a part of their liturgy something that's called the Apostles' Creed. So for 1,500 years, congregations across this world would repeat this, and I brought part of the Apostles' Creed with me. I want you to see this. They would say this, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered underneath Pontius Pilate. He was crucified, died, was buried, and notice this, he descended to hell. The third day, he rose from the dead, and he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of, of the Father Almighty, and from there he will come to judge the living and the dead. And what I need you to see, everybody, is that in the middle of the gap, Jesus was not just laying in a dead, cold tomb by himself. No, no, no. He was doing war on your behalf. He was pushing back. He was fighting back the very forces of darkness for you. The Bible says this. Yeah. It says this in Colossians. It says, and having disarmed the powers and authorities. In other words, let me say it like this. Jesus went into hell and all of the weapons that the demonic had, he took all their weapons away. He disarmed him. Like, wouldn't you have loved to have been there? Wait, wait. Wouldn't you have loved to have been there when Jesus walked into hell and seen the, eye, the look on the faces of those demons? I, I hope when I get to heaven someday, the Lord will let me see that. You know, in high definition, virtual reality. Come on, baby. It says he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the power of the cross. To which you may ask the question, hey PC, what did he disarm them of? Well, Jesus actually answers that for us. So about 70 or 80 years after the resurrection, John, one of Jesus' closest disciples, he was exiled to the island of Patmos, where he was supposed to live out the rest of his days where he would die. And on the Lord's day, the Lord Jesus himself shows up to John in a vision. And this is what John says about Jesus, the one that he walked with for three years on this earth. It says this in Revelation, that when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And the reason for that is because he was seeing Jesus in his glorified body. So he passes out, but he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, and I want you to notice these next four words, because I believe that for scores of us listening today, this is the word of the Lord for you. Do not be afraid. I know that you think that God is just lying in a grave and that he is not doing anything. I know that you feel like you are treading in the waters of life and it doesn't seem like things are getting better. I know that you feel like right now there is pain encroaching all around you and you're looking up saying, God, where are you? Do you not see me? You need to know today that you're a great God. Jesus himself is looking at you saying, 
Listen, I see you, and I don't need you to be afraid. Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. Which, by the way, all other gods are dead. Our God was dead. Come on, somebody. And behold, I am alive forevermore. And then he amens himself right there. I think that's the coolest thing ever. Jesus got so fired up, he just amen himself. <laughs> and then he said this, check this out. And he said, and I have the keys of Haiti. So just time out. Don't you just love that? Don't you just love the fact that the devil doesn't even have keys to his own house? coolest thing ever. I have the keys of Hades and death. And most people in the theological realm believe that he disarmed those principalities on that Saturday. On the day when everybody thought nothing was happening. Which, by the way, when you read about the fact that he, oh, that he has the keys of death and hell, you would need to know, and I'm telling you, I believe this, I've studied this so deeply, he's not just talking about an, uh, an, an eternal hell, an eternal death. He's also talking about an earthly hell and an earthly death. In other words, Saturday reminds us that while Jesus is warring, while we are waiting. Because, hey, everybody, he holds the keys to every single thing that you are walking through in your life. That death in your relationships, in your dreams, in your hopes, in your body, whatever hell it is that you're going through on this earth, your great God, Jesus, holds the keys to it all. And so let me start and talk to you a little bit about the practical side of all of this. Like, what's the practical side of the warring and the waiting? Because if you're going to be able to wait correctly before God, you're going to need to know two things. And if you're going to be able to engage in spiritual warfare and in warring, I'm going to have to teach you two things. And the first thing I'm going to share with you, honestly, <laughs> you're not going to like it. And that is that we're going to need to learn to wait patiently. Now, I'm going to be very honest with you. I am probably, in fact, I'm, I'm absolutely positive. I am the least patient person in this entire room. And don't you all look at me like you ain't... You're holier than thou, because I know I've seen some of you drive. <laughs> I'm just, I'm always in a hurry. I'm telling you, even if I'm not late to somewhere, I'm driving fast. I'm speeding. I'm pushing the limits. Kind of reminds me of the guy that asked God one day. He asked the Lord, he said, hey God, I um, <laughs> got a question for you. What's, what's, a, what's a million years like to you? God said, well, that's, that's like a second to me. He said, well, God, that's incredible. What's, what's like a million dollars to you? God said, well, that's, that's like a penny. God said, well, God, can I have one of your pennies? <laughs> and God said, yeah, in just a second. <laughs> Come on, everybody. That's funny. I don't care what you say. That's funny and corny. Okay, maybe cornier than funny. But there is some truth in that. And here's what I want you to see today. Please look in my eyes. God doesn't live in time. He lives outside the realm of time. And God sees your beginning and your end. And he sees you like right now, he, you are in the midst of pain and you're wondering, God, is this thing going to ever get fixed? Am I ever going to see a miracle to this all? And God sees you finishing well. He sees the miracle happening even in the season where you're questioning God's goodness in your life. Let me tell you something. God has a different perspective than the one that you have. God doesn't see tomorrow. Tomorrow will come and see God. 
God does not live in this universe. The universe lives on the inside of him. He's got a different perspective about the challenges and the things that you're walking through in your life. So for instance, if you've ever been in a parade and you've been on the side of the road and you're watching all of those floats come by you, there's a mystery as to what are the different floats that are coming up next because you can't see around the corner. But God doesn't stand next to you like that. He has a completely different perspective. He's actually, in essence, up on the Goodyear blimp. And when he looks down, he sees the beginning of the parade and he sees the end of the parade all in one moment in time. And when he sees you, he sees all of it. He sees you being healed. He sees you having victory. He sees you coming through on all of these challenges that you're so wondering by and you're so worried by and there's so much anxiety in your life. No, hey everybody, listen to me. Your God is with you. And I say that to you because it would behoove us all to just begin to trust God, to just slow down and wait. Just wait. And that's tough for those of us that we, we live in this Americanized culture of drive throughs and Amazon and but I'm going to tell you something. God doesn't operate in an American culture. You think about Abraham. God promised Abraham. He said, my man, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. I'm going to bless you massively. In a time when Abraham had no kids. So Abraham waited and he waited and he waited and there was no promise. And so what did he do? He took matters into his own hands. He created an Ishmael, which we're still dealing with the effects of that generations down the line now. And he finally waited. He finally got to the place. He pulled back and said, okay, God, I'm going to do what it is you asked me to do. And that's when God showed up and said, okay, Abraham, now that you are 100 years old, you, you are well past the age of being able to reproduce Sexually, I'm now going to step in because you can't do it in the flesh anymore so it can only be me. And God gave him the promise. That's why it says in, in Hebrews, check this out. And so after, what? Mm, I promise you, not one of you have that verse on your refrigerator. <laughs> Nobody. Abraham received what was promised. Which kind of brings me to the question of the day. Why does God do this? Like if God can do it now, do it now. Why? You ready for this? It's because he's after a thing called a twofer. Come on, Texans, you know what a twofer is. It's a two for one. See, your God's got this ability that he can actually develop character on the inside of you while at the same time answering your prayer. And you're not going to like what I'm about to say next. But your great God is actually just as concerned about developing character in you as he is answering your prayer. Oh, that's so good, I'm going to say that again. And I'm going to say it over here. I'm going to tell you that your God is just as concerned about developing character on the inside of you as he is in answering your prayer. In fact, I'll show this to you. It says in James, it says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds. Because, hey, everybody, I'm trying to help you out today. I need you to see that your, the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Amen. And somebody might say, yeah, but God, I just would rather you answer my prayer. And God's looking back at you and saying, yeah, but I'm actually trying to develop something on the inside of you. Here's what you need to know. When something is happening to you, you can be 100% assured that God is trying to do something in you. 
So when there's somebody that is in your life that upsets you, maybe somebody you work with, maybe a client, maybe somebody in your sphere of relational influence, you're 100% right. They are 100% wrong. Mark my word today. God has enrolled you in a school of character. And do you know how to get out of that school quicker? Do you know how to actually graduate from the school of character? You ready for this? Pass the test. So if you don't pass the test, you have to retake the test. But if you pass the test, you get to move on. And some of y'all have been taking the same test for a long time. See, a better way to approach God is to say, okay, God, I'm in the middle of the gap. I'm in the Saturdays of life. And I don't get it. I don't see any visible sign that you're actually working in my life. But God, instead of me asking the question, why is all of this happening? I'm going to ask you a different question. What is it that you're wanting me to learn? What do you want to teach me? See, it says in James, it says, Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And that's what we all want, right? But in order for that to happen, you have to go through the journey. So we're not just going to wait. But number two, we're going to actually wait hopefully. Hopefully. And this is the encouraging part of the day. In fact, I'm about to do something that I rarely ever do in our services. I'm going to encourage the fire out of you. We're going to see God do something so incredible in your life in just one second. Because in just a moment, I'm going to take my place and the authority that God has given to me as a pastor And I'm going to pray the prayer of faith over your life. For those of you that you've been in this season of waiting. And it just doesn't seem like God is moving. And I believe that God is going to rise to the occasion. I believe that God is going to begin to war on your behalf. I want you to get yourself ready for it. Because it's about to happen. It says in Hebrews. It says you need to persevere. So that when you have done the will of God. You will receive What he has promised. For in just a little while. Which by the way, that's God's little while. Not ours. In just a little while, he who is coming will come and he will not delay. But my righteous one will live by faith. And that's us. And I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. And I apologize for how simple this is about to be, but I have to do what it is that I felt the Lord speak to me. Because I heard him say these few words to me, to speak it over somebody. Because for some of you, the word of the Lord for you today is don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up on that marriage. Don't give up on your kids. Don't give up on your dreams. Don't give up on your business. Don't give up on the fact that God is going to heal you. Don't give up. I know you feel tired. I know you feel exhausted. I know that there's so many times you feel like you need to throw in the towel and just say enough is enough. But the word of the Lord for you today is don't give up. Keep pushing through. The Bible says in the book of Galatians, it says, don't get tired in doing the right thing. Because that's just the right time. That's God's time. We will reap a harvest of blessing if if we what? Don't give up. You are an answer to somebody's prayer right now. And the enemy is sowing all these seeds of 
depression, guilt. He's put on the side of you this heart that says, I just don't know if I can do this anymore. And the Spirit of God is speaking to you today saying, don't you dare give up. So we're going to wait on God's time, not our time, because he sees the beginning and the end. He's got a different perspective. And we're going to wait with great hope on the inside of us because our great God will never leave us. He will never abandon us. But then we're going to do just exactly what Jesus did. And that's this. We're going to work continually, consistently. You say, what do I mean by that? Let me just tell you that there's going to be many situations that you go through in your life that you're going to have to learn how to grab hold of the horns of the altar and pull down heaven into your life and into your world. And you're going to need to fight in prayer. You're going to have to fight on day one for prayer. You're going to, you're going to need to war on day two and day three and day four and day 21 and six months after that and four years after that and 15 years after that that we just deny to be denied. We refuse to be refused. Let me tell you something. God honors bold prayers because bold prayers honor God. And what we need to understand today is that prayer is not only a connection with our God, it's also contending with the enemy in our lives. And I could have given you over 20 different verses on this. I don't have the time for that today. But I am going to give you this. It says in 2 Corinthians, for though we live in this world... We do not wage war as the world does. The weapons that we fight with. Which by the way, let me say it like this. Are you in the fight? Are you in the fight? Because the Bible is assuming, is making the assumption that you are. The weapons we fight with, they are not weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Do you know what a stronghold is? You ready for this? A stronghold is any area in your life, literally by, by definition, is any area in your life that, these, that your spiritual enemy, Satan, has convinced you is true, but it's not. And for some of you, the enemy has convinced you that you're never going to have a great marriage that you're going to never be free in your life. Some of you, you've been praying and believing God for a baby in your life, and it and he's just convinced you that it's never going to happen. The miracle's never going to happen. The dream's never going to happen. Your business is never going to be a success. It's never going to be off the ground. You're always going to be battling in your finances. You will never really please God in your life and how you live for him. And let me tell you something, everybody. That's a stronghold. It's a lie. And we demolish those arguments and every pretension. In other words, everything that pretends to be above God and greater than God. That sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought and we make it obedient to Christ. We do that every day. Every day. Every day we're going to pray. Every day we're going to war. We battle in prayer every day. I'm going to tell you that every single day. I call up my sweet baby Blakely, my daughter's voice in prayer. And I pray that God, I pray, I pray in Jesus' mighty name that she will never experience another seizure in her life again. In Jesus' mighty name. I pray for healing. I pray for my kids every day. I pray for their spouses someday, every single day. Many of you don't even know this. I pray for you all like you wouldn't believe it every day. In the back seat of your chair pocket, there's a little connection card. And you may not know this, but every time that you fill that little connection card out, I get a report every single week. 
And when your names come across my computer screen, I stop what I'm doing. I grab that screen and I begin to pray for you by name. I begin to pray that cancer will be eradicated in Jesus' mighty name. I pray that depression goes in Jesus' mighty name. I pray that that business that you are launching and starting and expanding would be expanded in Jesus' mighty name. I pray that that heart condition would be healed in Jesus' mighty name. For those of you that you've lost loved ones and your heart is breaking, I lift you up in prayer every single week and I ask the God of the universe to step into your life like we pray every day continually but we don't just war continually we also war confidently why? because we have the name of Jesus speak his name and so I close with this verse from the great apostle Paul that he wrote while he was in prison and being found in appearance as a man he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death even death on a cross therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him a name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee which that includes the devils will bow and watch this in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. God sees your beginning and he sees your end. You may feel like you're in the gap and you might feel like it just doesn't seem like God's answering. He's not moving on my behalf. But I'm going to tell you that in the gap, your great God is not just lying dead in a tomb. No, no, no. He is contending with hell. He is pushing back the forces of hell on your behalf. And your miracle is on the way. Your, your victory is on the way. So don't give up. Don't be afraid. Your great God is with you. He is fighting for you. He is warring on your behalf. And you will see the salvation and the victory and the might of God come Come on, everybody. Buck up under it, little buckaroo, and get ready for the touch of God to hit your life. Amen. And so do me a favor all across this place. Would you just close your eyes? And just bow your heads. Let me pray this over you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for your people. I take my place as the pastor of this church and I come against that spirit, that stronghold in lives that would convince us of something that is not true. And yet we've bought into it and we've thought that it is. And so God, I come against, Lord, discouragement. I come against anxiety. I come against fear fear in Jesus' mighty name. I call it out and I root it out of your life in Jesus' mighty name. And instead, I pray that the fresh wind of the breath of the Spirit of God would be breathed into your life. Father, I pray that the season of waiting in the life of your people, God, would come to an end. And God, that they would see the promise that you have given, Lord, become a reality, I pray, in Jesus' mighty name. So God, as we speak your name, we thank you, God, that you speak peace and miracles and your touch over us. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. So come on, why don't you close your eyes, open up your hands, and just allow the words of this song to wash over you as I believe the Spirit of God is going to touch you. In Jesus' name.